Hello everyone. We're just gonna wait for Margaret Roach Wheeler to join in and then we'll go ahead and get started. So just bear with me for just a little bit. Margaret right now. Hi, Hello. How are you? You look lovely. I love well, my hair. So are you. <laughs> it's good to see you. Great to see you. So for everyone just joining in now, um, we are here live with Margaret Roach Wheeler. Um, and this is part of our um, SAR Artist Live series here at the Indian Arts Research Center. Um, so my name is Emily Santanam. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation um, and I'm an Anne Ray intern at the Indian Arts Research Center. Um, and for the month of April, we're running a special indigenous fashion series. Um, so myself and my fellow intern, Shandine Brown, We'll be chatting with artists, creators, and curators who are working within the field. Um, so just a reminder, if you have any questions or comments throughout, you can just tap them into the comment box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be sure to answer them throughout our chat. Um, so to start off this event, I'm joined by Chickasaw and Choctaw artist Margaret Roach Wheeler, who's an award-winning weaver, fiber artist, and textile expert. Margaret is the owner of Mahoda Handwovens and is the founder of Mahoda Textiles, which is a business that is owned and operated by the Chickasaw Nation. Her Southeastern and Mississippian-inspired woven works have been exhibited across the country, including the Museum of Art and Design, the Peabody Essex Museum, and the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts here in Santa Fe. So Margaret was inducted into the Chickasaw Hall of Fame in 2010, and just last year was inducted into um, the Chickasaw Dynamic Woman of the Year um, honor. So thank you for making time for us today, Margaret. Um, and before we jump into our questions and discussion of your work, I was hoping you could just introduce yourself in your own words. Um, my name is Margaret Roach Wheeler. I am a textile uh, artist, uh, hand weaver mostly is what I have done. And um, I am now, um, and I'm here at this moment, in the new textile design um, that we're doing with the Chickasaw Tribe. So, um, and we're in Sulphur, Oklahoma. So thank you for having me today. Yes, of course. Um, if you wouldn't mind maybe talking a little bit about your um, history in the textile arts and sort of how you came to that career field and what that experience has looked like. Um, well, I will start in the very beginning because I knew all my life I wanted to be an artist. And um, being Native American in Chickasaw, I um, was born in South Dakota where my father was an educational field agent with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And from there, he moved to Nes Pelham uh, with the Colville Agency, and then from there to the Blackfoot Agency in Montana. Then finally, they came back to Oklahoma where my parents were. So I was so influenced by other art, um, by natives. I mean, I, I would see these huge murals on the walls that were painted during the um, WPA. And I just knew I wanted to be an artist. And so from grade school all the way up through high school, I, I did every art class I could take. And, um, and it just seemed like that was it. So when I started on my um, undergraduate work, we, um, we were living at that time in, uh, we were on the Navajo reservation where my husband was teaching. And I started in Flagstaff at Northern Arizona University and then we were transferred. So it took five schools and 10 years for me to get my degree. And, uh, but I came out with a painting and a um, sculpture were my main things. And I was doing metal sculpture and entering shows with that. And I, I got a teaching degree along with the arts. So I was teaching on the high school level. And um, 
they decided they wanted a jewelry class. So I started working on my master's in jewelry. And after the first semester, I realized I didn't want to be a jeweler. I didn't like the small pieces and the filing and everything. So I switched to um, textiles on the master's program. Marjorie Schick was probably one of the biggest influences on my artistic career. And she uh, was at Pittsburgh State University where I was going to school in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Small university in the middle of, of uh, Kansas, or well, it really wasn't, it was right near Joplin, Missouri where I was living. And um, in the southeast corner of Kansas. And um, she was so dynamic and her art was seen all over the world. Um, and while I was, uh, she was under her tutelage, she was showing at the Whitney Museum in New York, other museums, and it really made me believe I can do this. You know, if somebody else is doing it, I can do it and not have to be in a major city, um, which I raised a family, and so I, it wasn't easy for me to travel with children and everything. So Marjorie had us put together portfolios, and in 1978, I graduated with a master's degree with emphasis in textiles. Now that is the part that um, Marjorie didn't know anything about textiles when she took the job. She was a jeweler, but she was excellent in design and teaching and pushed you in many, many ways. And so I came into weaving through an art department where it was all experimentation. We just had the looms, we could get the yarns, we could do what we wanted but we were taught design and, um, and how to present it, how to set a show up, how to put a portfolio together. She had us entering shows. So by the time I graduated, I had a pretty good portfolio of textile designs and I was doing clothing at that time. And I will go back a little bit to say, but the when I was three years old, I was tying scarves around me to make dresses, to make skirts, to make things. So I'd always loved clothing and I was sewing in a 4-H program, um, what, third grade, you're uh, making a headscarf. In the fourth grade, you're making a, a skirt. In the fifth grade, and, and so I was sewing all my life. Plus, my mother and my grandmother, um, my grandmother lived in our home, and they were always sewing and had me sewing, too. So it was something that I grew up with. But I had never thought of the textiles or the sewing and the embroidering and those kind of things as my artwork. And coming up through Marjorie and that program, I really saw that textiles could be artwork. But I also discovered at that time that, um, and I've been showing paintings and I've been showing uh, sculpture. And when I tried to get into those shows with my textiles, I was not admitted because they didn't, it was more of a craft and a fine art. And so I had to start all over again. Wow. And so, so it's it's really interesting to see how far textiles have come since that period of time, because now major museums are showing textiles and uh, it is an art form. And so that's how I got into being a, uh, textile artist. Instead of learning by recipe like I would have done if I, I was taking weaving classes, you know, we were just let loose to play. And so it was just this freedom with, with that. And the loom also um, was very structured for me, which I needed. And so that, that was something the minute I sat down at a loom, I knew this is what I wanted to do. So I switched completely from painting and sculpture to textile sculpture, more or less. Wow, that is quite the story and quite the shifting in terms of uh, your medium throughout your career. Um, you went on to teach um, art education at different points in your life as well. Um, what did that look like? And how did your background sort of help you in terms of mentorship? Well. Um, I taught on the high school level for 10 years, a class called Fiber and Metal, teaching jewelry, and we taught all kinds of fiber. I did soft sculpture, batik, um, paper making, 
and weaving also. And so uh, it was really rewarding. And I, I love teaching. I love teaching, um, especially high school students. Everybody always says, why would you take high school? It, it was just the most formative years I felt like. And they were coming out with a product at the end. And I think over English teachers, history teachers, um, art teachers sometimes have an edge of getting the students involved because you can get their work out there. And back in, I, I started teaching in 75 and taught through 85. And um, at that period of time, I could put the student's work for sale um, friend had a frame shop and they were selling their bracelets and selling their necklaces and selling uh, like whatever we were making. We had the opportunity to sell, which was also great for students wanting to be in your class and trying to do the best they could do because they knew it would be presented to the public. And so I absolutely loved those 10 years, but I was also at the same time weaving, doing shows, um, developing a line of clothing. And so when my son graduated from college, it sort of opened up a, a space for me to quit teaching, open my own business. And so I did that in 1985, I opened my own business. And really in 84, I opened, uh, uh, and I was with a group of seven artists and I had my shingle on the door. My, and Mahoda uh, handwovens, and Mahoda. Then I decided on that name at that period of time because that was my great 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 three greats grandmother, who uh, was Chickasaw, who came with removal from Indian to uh, from Mississippi to Indian Territory, and so I wanted to honor that, and so I named my business Mahoda, and. Um, I've always loved the name, and sorry, my parents didn't name me Mahoda, but <laughs> so, so I got to use it. Many people call me Mahoda because of, of the title of the uh, business, but um, it's, it's been a wonderful business. And so um, I think I sent you some photos. Uh, what I tried to do was, um, I, like Marjorie had us do the portfolio, when I knew I wanted to go out and try to make this a business, I took my portfolio and went to um, the Heard Museum, the Gilcrease Museum, the Idle George Museum, the, um, which was the other one, uh, Southern Plains Museum in Oklahoma. And I got shows in all of those museums that I went to, mostly fashion shows. Um, the Wheelwright Museum started, had, they had a yearly fashion show, I got into that. And so I was working through museums just in the, in the mid 80s. And, um, and being in Santa Fe, seeing the Santa Fe Indian market and knowing the Indian markets, um, I eventually got into the Indian markets. But at that time, I was the only Native American doing a line of woven clothing. And um, it, was, it, was, it was a good time for me to have my work out there and have it seen in, in the Indian market. So I did five or six Indian markets a year and we try to have a hundred garments, but those garments were what I call my street clothes. And um, my love was doing more of the costume looking um, garments. So if you've got some slides, I think I sent you. Yeah, let me go ahead. Um, about those. Yes, I'll actually just flip my screen here and I'll show them up on my laptop. Give me one second. Great. This is, um, this is Forest Dweller or the Bear. And the Museum of Art and Design um, shows this piece to be in Changing Hands, Art Without Reservation, which was an exhibit that toured. And it is all hand woven. Um, I use a summer winter weave design. And, um, but, um, I, I've been able to do so much with that. And here I was trying to make that rough, furry texture that's in the vest of this piece. And then the bear itself, this goes back then to my sculpture. And um, I was being, I was able to sculpt the fabric and make it into a costume. 
And so that was my first big piece to, to get into a, a major museum e exhibition. And the next one. Um, this is like from my street clothes, um, what I call my street clothes. This is the kind of pieces that I was doing for the Indian markets. Um, weaving and it always had Native American theme. And with that summer winter weave pattern, I could get um, ribbon work, I could get a uh, bead work look, um, I could do quill work look. And so I developed patterns that would simulate Native American designs. And I could incorporate it into my fabric where I wanted. This is a silk wool piece with a, um, a Tibetan fur collar on it. And the next one? The collar is beautiful. Well, thank this you. This whole piece is lovely. And this is another one of my streetwear pieces that I did. And this one is in wool, uh, a jacket. It has uh, suede uh, sleeves and then the uh, fur for the cuffs and the collar. But again, you can see how I'm using my weave design to make the designs in the fabric. Okay, the next mm -hmm. one. And this um, is, was my bread and butter. Blouses, shawls, jackets. And um, so, you know, I think the thing that got me with the Indian markets is I was getting away from doing my artwork. What I was doing is um, just being a production weaver, sitting at the loom, producing all of these things and getting ready for the next show. And so even though it was, it was a good business and I loved it, I didn't feel like I was doing the artwork. Every now and then I get to work on one of my art pieces, but the majority of the time it was just weaving from early in the morning to late at night to get things done. And I think most artists get into that, um, especially if they're doing art markets and they have to have volume to sell. Okay, the next one. That takes a lot of discipline to work that kind of way. And what I finally did is I bought a loom that is uh, 72 inches wide. So instead of weaving, um, you know, a front and then weaving a back panel to a blouse, I could do the whole blouse and then all my pattern always matched when I tried to put it together. So that was my big production loom and I could weave big pieces of cloth. And mm -hmm. then this again, this was sort of a turning point in my life uh, because I was raised by around so many different tribes. A lot of my early work was Plains uh, Southwest tribes, but in uh, about 15, 16 years ago, I went to a listening conference for the Chickasaws in Oklahoma City. I had never lived around the Chickasaw tribe, but I had heard they had a um, uh, arts and humanities department and I took my portfolio and went to that. And um, uh, Lona Barrett looked at my work and immediately they hired me as an artist in residence with the tribe and to work on a production uh, Lowak Shopala, which I would do, the, and I think that's coming up. But what I was going to say, the turning point was me. I started researching um, Chickasaw clothing at that period of time. And um, my first piece that I really did was a Chickasaw hunting coat that I had seen in our, our history catalog of uh, two boys wearing this style with the big collar and it was belted. And so the first one I did and entered in the herd show, I won best of class. And I had not won an award like that with any of my other pieces that I thought were really strong. But all at once it felt like these Chickasaw pieces were sort of coming from my heart. They were authentic, you know, that I was doing something that was good. And that was uh, really wonderful to win that award and sort of turn my career around as far as the type of work I was doing. And so um, I really did it. And at that listening conference, I think, uh, let's try the next slide. I think it's... Uh... Well, we have the messenger next, but we can jump to Loak yeah. Shopala. So uh, Loak Shopala, um, I had to do 
Uh, it wound up being 86 costumes, but only about 11 of them were hand woven. And I got to trace Chickasaw history through their garments for a thousand years, going back to the Mississippians. And um, in 2000, I had a um, fellowship with the Smithsonian and I was studying um, textiles, um, Mississippian textiles. And of course, there wasn't a whole lot of them left, but Spyro has some excellent examples that I got to research and do. But I was looking at other things like the Mississippian shell carvings and, the, and our uh, gorgettes, which have pictures of people. They're, they were their gods, more or less, or their, uh, their spiritual um, people that were um, had clothing on. And I could see what the clothing was. While I was taking photos, I was sketching. And so, you know, 10 years later, I got to use all that research from the Smithsonian and putting these costumes together for the Chickasaw tribe. Um, and so it was, again, it was so rewarding to do this. And LaDonna Brown, who is a historian with our tribe, gave me the greatest compliment and said, I brought that period to life through these clothings. And so you can see here, most of it is taken from things that I saw at the Smithsonian that I could incorporate in these costumes. And these are the clan costumes. And uh, so right now, the, the two of the clan costumes are in an exhibit in Oklahoma City on Spyro. And it's my uh, panther woman and my uh, minko. And so um, they, they belong to the Chickasaws and they're in their cultural center where they store them, keep them in tissue and in boxes. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to see um, them taken care of so well and to be loaned out when there's a need. Two years ago, Jared Tate was the composer and the originator for Lowak Chopala. And uh, he wrote all the classical music. And the clans has been shown, um, I bet, five or six times, maybe more. But the costumes have come out twice. Once for the World Creativity Conference. We did a live performance with, with uh, the costumes and the music. And then two years ago, the Oklahoma City Philharmonic brought them on. And so, you know, it's just exciting to see these come back out. And so that was another turning point in my life. Definitely. And just to clarify, you didn't have a team working with you on these pieces. It was all, no. all no, hand done. I did them all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is stunning. <laughs> just in case them. people weren't aware. Yeah. No, I did them. So, uh, and then this piece, um, the Peabody Museum was putting together an exhibit um, called Native Fashion Now. And this was my owl, and it is all silk wool hand woven. And again, it made it into that show and toured with them to major museums and was finally bought by the uh, Portland Art Museum. So it was one of my pieces I was very, very proud of. And one of the reasons I, I did the owl was my grandmother who lived with us was so frightened by owls that, you know, if one hooted near the house, she was always knew someone was going to die or something bad was going to happen. And I'd be out trying to search to find the owls. So owls have always <laughs> been very mysterious to me. And so I finally got to do one. And I call these the spirit animals, the ones that have the birds and the um, headdresses. And I have quite a few. I just was showing a few today. So. This is beautiful. And the color scheme especially is so unexpected and really lovely. Well, I do a lot of research, and when I uh, was working on this, I had a photograph of an owl flying at night, and it was this rust and pink colors all in it. It was a beautiful photograph. And when I'm lecturing, sometimes I will show the photograph and then my interpretation, um, to, just to show where the ideas came from. So, mm -hmm. and, not, and also, I get to bring my jewelry in a little bit on this. Uh, this is copper. His, Beak is copper, which was also something the Chickasaws or the Mississippians really um, ha used a lot in repose and things like that. So these are handmade conchos on the, the shawl with beadwork. And then beadwork is also on the uh, 
face mask, and then the, the, the beak is, is um, copper. Mm -hmm. So a lot of beadwork in this. And also with the metal, I mean, there is that sculptural element going back yes. to your art yeah. history. Yes, yes. That's very true. That's why I sort of wanted to show those. And then this is my latest work. Uh, there was an exhibit called Visual Voices, uh, Contemporary Chickasaw Art. And um, so I have taken it off the body now. And these are completely sculpted, um, hand-woven sculptures now, I feel like. And you can see I've, I'm, uh, I'm casting, I hand cast in life masks that I make. And this happens to be one of my students when I was in high school named Danny Alley. And I'm still using the mold of his face. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's, it's something that changes every time you cast it. You'll get a little bit of a change. So this one is called The Crow. It's the murder of, of one. And um, it has, a, uh, there is a thin line of, of red that goes from his heart down into all the red that's below that symbolizes the lives that were lost, you know, in the, uh, in the Europeans coming and taking over the Native American. And so any, I'm not good at talking about political things, but that is sort of my, my uh, statement about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I appreciate that you sent a zoomed in photo of the um, beaded headpiece as well because yes. that's really intricate. Well, and on this, that is silver work by Mary Mayo. We worked together and her daughter, Alice uh, McKee, did a lot of the sewing uh, for me. And so um, that piece was done and uh, Mary did, did the silver work on it. And then of course the bead work and everything uh, was added. So okay. yeah, I, I use a lot of bead work on the bigger designs. Mm -hmm. How often do you collaborate with other artists for some of I your large pieces? That was really one of the few times Alice was sewing for me and when I was doing the Indian markets. And uh, so I was wanting to do some of the bigger pieces. And um, so she just was excellent at ideas and putting things together. And she said, my mom does silver work. And so we all three would get together. I would do all the sketches of what I wanted. I would weave the cloth and then we'd construct them, put them together and, and do it. And this one's got another story. We're getting late on time, but this one I did early on. It was a raven. It sold in Santa Fe um, in 1993. It sold in Santa Fe and was gone. And then a, a state auction called me my name was in it and they traced me down and um, they wanted to know all about it. And so I wound up buying it back, <laughs> it into the crow. So this is a very old piece that's been redone and I had to pay a lot more for it than it sold for almost originally. So that made me feel very good. <laughs> I increased, my value had increased, so yeah. I and love that there's sort of like a cyclical aspect to this one in terms of it kind of morphing into different shapes. Yes. And, and my husband did the base of it. I wanted it to be a crow in a tree. And so I did a base for it. And then, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it, they evolve. My work always evolves. I get an idea and I start and then it evolves as it goes together. I said, it more or less tells me sometimes what, what it wants to be. And uh, so, but this is, this is the, one of the latest pieces. And then I have one more that was in the Visual Voices exhibit. And this is the, um, this is Lita. Um, the Mississippians um, use swan capes. The elite would wear the swan capes. And so I'd always wanted to do a swan cape. So this is all handwoven handwoven feathers and then the swan coming around and then a woman and it is all handwoven hand sculpted and um, so uh, again it's a, a woven sculpture and I playing back to uh, Lita um, 
that Zeus came down and seduced the chief's wife. And so I'm tying in that. So um, again, so these were just shown. They were touring for two years and they're now home. And, uh, and it's exciting because I'm now working on some other pieces for other exhibits. But I think that was the last slide, right? Yes, that is the last slide. So I'll go and flip this back around. Um, okay. Those were really beautiful, and I'm glad that we got sort of um, a time trajectory of the differences that your work um, has sort of shown through the years in terms of your early work, moving on to present day. Um, and in terms of the current exhibits that you're working on, what sort of projects are you diving into these days? Um, one of them that I just finished is really a Choctaw piece, and um, it, is, it is a stickball player, and it's all hand-woven body, and no head on this one, but I've done, uh, it's gonna be a shown in Ireland, hopefully. Friend who's putting the, the um, exhibit together has a Fulbright to Ireland, is working with uh, uh, artists of mixed heritage. And is my that father, Clark? Yes, Laura Clark is working on that. And, uh, and because of COVID, it was supposed to go last August. And uh, we're hoping this August that everything will be okay and she can travel <laughs> and, and take the exhibit. But um, so I, I, my father was Irish and Choctaw. My mother is Chickasaw, Chickasaw Scottish. So I had, I had both, but I did a Mahotan tartan. So the breechcloth is a tartan. And then I've done a Choctaw band that is uh, stitched and um, have had handmade sticks made for it and a leather pouch that's on it. So I've just finished that piece last August. And, um, and then I've been worked on uh, some cross stitch pieces also that I'm working on. So, but I also want to, before our time is up, talk about my current thing, if that's okay. Yes, yeah, Mahota Textiles. I see yes. some uh, textiles behind you there. So yes. you're in the studio in Sulphur, <laughs> yes? Yes. Um, when I came with the Chickasaws and I finished Low Walk, um, they wanted me to open a weaving studio. And so I opened a weaving studio here in Sulphur. Um, we have a, a spa hotel and across the street is the artesian uh, art studios and, and uh, gallery. And so I opened a weaving studio there and brought all my looms there. And I lived in Joplin, Missouri. I now live in Sulphur, Oklahoma. I moved here, but I brought all my looms down. And when COVID hit last year, we had 14 weavers in, in the studio off and on and uh, three or four that were there every day. So it was really a wonderful time. But one of the things with weaving on a floor loom most of, of, of your designs have to be stair-step designs. And like what I've got on sort of, you know, a lot of diamond shapes you can make and all, but making a circle is more difficult and curvier linear lines can be difficult. And so um, years ago, I tried to figure out about how to get really Southeastern Mississippian designs into my work and I figured I had to go to a computer. And I, I tried that. I went to a friend's house and I hated working on the computerized <laughs> loom. It was, you had to do everything on the, uh, the computer and then transfer it. And all you did is push pedals and throw it. There was no immediate um, design ideas that could change in the middle. And so I didn't like it and I couldn't see it for myself and I dropped the idea. Then when I got into the weaving studio here in Sulphur, I, I realized that this might be a good business for the tribe, uh, the Chickasaw tribe. So I wrote a proposal to our governor, Governor Anatebi, and uh, he accepted it. And so we had to put together a business plan and I had met young people uh, through the gallery and through the Artesian Gallery that helped put together a business plan. And uh, they also want us to go through the Chickasaw Shark Tank. 
And before we could become a business, we had to have our actual product, we had to display it, and we had to defend it more or less. And so we did that and we passed. We exceeded their expectations, they said. So, <laughs> of course you did, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so they anyway backed us and uh, we only have two employees and me. I'm the president and founder, but I'm not a good business person. So uh, Bethany uh, McCord is our business manager who has an MBA and wrote the business plan and has been here since we really you know, gave our proposal to the governor. Then Taloa mm -hmm. Underwood is design and operation. And um, it, she is fantastic with what she's designing for Mahoda. And, right. uh, but before they came on, I had to learn how to design on a computer. I did the first three blankets because we didn't have anybody at that time, you know. And so I, I learned how to work on a computer and do a blanket. Our first mill was in North Carolina the Oreo mill, and we went there, and um, they agreed to do a limited amount of work for our shark tank, and um, then when we got accepted, we made our first order to the mill for our blankets, and um, that was, we started um, three years ago, I believe, with the first blankets. We sold at our um, what we call the annual meeting or the Southeastern Art Market and Sale. And we did real good the first day. And um, then we've moved into the building I'm in now um, two years ago. And um, it has just been a wonderful space. We're right on, I've got Taloa sleeping out the door here. So. <laughs> and um, we, um, um, have been here two years. I believe it's June is when we, they, they remodeled the building and we moved in here and we're right on Main Street, two blocks from the hand weaving studio and it's gorgeous. And I can show you, we just last week got our, um, we turn out three blankets a year. So we now have nine blankets in our, we started out with, um, just those three that I had designed. And I'm proud to say we have, I think we're sold out right now of the Chickasaw map design. Um, we've pulled in some consignment pieces to have a few extra here. And, uh, but that's very gratifying to sell out. And so we will come out in 22 with the new Chickasaw map blanket. And we have changed mills. Uh, we now are with uh, MTL mill, in Pennsylvania and they're wonderful to work with. We really, they came here to even see us and our facilities. So, and they're doing an excellent job for us. So I'm gonna see, I don't know if I can turn my screen around. I couldn't find that like you can on a phone. Yeah, so, it should be a little um, like two arrows, one on top of another, sort of looking in a circle. Okay. And if you click that yep. button. There it is, there it is, all right. So I want to give you a tour of our thing. We have a, a wall. We have pillows, tote bags, um, purses, and we now have a silk scarf that we just have come in. Oh, so beautiful. These are the um, purses down below. And so this is sort of our display wall once you come in the front door. And then we have a, a wall, and these are our brand new blankets that just went up last week. Wow. And um, in front is a chair. In this, the chair I have upholstered in one of the original, we're calling them the Heritage Designs. And then this was designed by Taloa Underwood. And Dustin Mater, we have a guest artist every year, and Dustin Mater is our guest artist. And uh, we are at this moment folding these blankets up. And then this is the third one at Taloa. And it's in our rivers and sun. It's about life. And there's stories with each blanket. And Dustin's is the two brothers, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw, and um, brothers that, that we have our, our story in the poles that we know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. And then this one is, is one of the heritage designs on there. And then we've got pillows from... These are the 20 uh, pillow designs, that sweet grass. 
And then we always do the showroom different each season. So this is our showroom display, which for spring is a baby cradle that's hanging from a, from a rod. And so, <laughs> and then we have a quilt in one of our new blankets and um, that a local artisan Mary Wiles made for us. Her husband, Joe, does all of our woodwork. We had a fireplace in here for um, winter and someone bought the fireplace. The cradle has already sold. And so oh, wow. it's wonderful, yeah. And then we, I did a little sheep. Joe made a stool with a head and a sheep's head and we covered it with the cloth. So that is, is our spring showroom. That's and I also had two great grandbabies last year. So that was celebrating them. <laughs> well, congratulations on that. And all the new products yeah. that we're creating. And this is one of Taloa's uh, 20, 20 designs that she did. Those blankets have been doing well. And so that's it. That's it. Our guest artist last year was uh, Joanna Underwood, who is a Chickasaw potter, and she did the Chickasaw pottery. So I urge everybody to go look at our website, which is mahotatextiles.com. And um, you can see all of our work. And you can see we're right on Main Street here. So, <laughs> is yeah, I miss being in downtown Sulphur. It's nice to see the main road out there. It is. It's a great, it's a great little town. It really is. I've enjoyed it here. So mm -hmm. it's a good place to live. Yeah. Well, I love that we ended on the note of sort of where your work uh, has been going in terms of um, also that commercial side of getting into um, the homewares and the blankets um, and yet not still losing out on a lot of that cultural work that you're doing. Um, it seems like if anything, you've just kind of been broadening <laughs> the sphere of arts that you create, um, which is pretty spectacular. Um, I guess if um, any of our viewers would want to get in touch with you or had other questions about your work, where would be the best place they could um, reach out to you? Um, Mahota at brightok.net is my, my uh, website. Of course, if you go to Mahota Textiles and you send a message, they would get it to me. And that would, might be the simplest. But um, it's M-A-H-O-T-A -A at B-R-I-G-H-T O-K dot net. That's my uh, uh, email address. Okay, let me go ahead and put it into the chat in case anybody needs that. Mahota at brightok.net. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and I guess just as one of our final questions, sort of wrapping up the first series of um, our Indigenous fashion um, episodes, where do you think or see or hope the future of Indigenous fashion and textile arts um, will head into or will move into? Well, since I first started, and especially I'll take just Santa Fe as an example, um, there were three or four well-known fashion designers, you know, that, that were there. And they had a fashion show um, on the plaza. And um, now, when I got to the end, I haven't done Santa Fe in about five years now, six years. And um, the last time I went, it was amazing how that had grown, how many more good designers there were and young designers. And so, you know, I can just see it flourishing because when I first started, there was not many. And, um, and especially in, in hand wovens. And I still don't know if there's anybody doing the hand wovens. But, um, I mean, you look at Jamie Akuma, who's this, you know, in Vogue magazine. Um, in um, Orlando Do Doogie. He's just doing wonderful things. He was coming on just as I was ending up my career in Santa Fe. And so I just see the, you know, the future is bright for fashion design. And um, Native Fashion Now at the Peabody Museum was great to bring out so many different fashion designers. And that show toured and got rave reviews, made it into the New York Times. Um, Wall Street Journal, I think, even had an article on it. So that was unheard of, you know, 30 years ago when I started. But um, so 
future of fashion is big. And then the Santa Fe has the big fashion show. I thought about sending you a video of that. I thought, no, I'm going to take too much time. But um, <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful fashion that um, that show is just exquisite. So I'd urge people to try to see that. You can see it online, I think, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you uh, have that collection that you showed back in 2019, was it? At Swaya's Fashion Show? Yes, Swaya Fashion Show. Just unbelievable, unbelievable artists in it. So no, fashion is just booming, I feel like, right now. And so it's exciting to see that it's coming full circle, you know, from from not being known at all and coming all the way around now to be way up there at the top. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful. And I think that's a perfect place to <laughs> end our conversation on such an optimistic and bright note. Um, so thank you so much for being generous with your time and with sharing your experience in this field. Um, I feel like a lot of younger professionals in the indigenous fashion world have so much to learn from you. Um, so thank you for uh, sharing that knowledge. Uh, and I do just wanna say for our viewers who are still currently on, um, next week we'll be having Shandi Brown on and she'll be having a live chat with Bethel Owen-Reese and Darby Raymond Overstreet, who together founded Just Beaded Thing, which is a collective that creates and sells beaded items handcrafted with intention and originality. Um, so that'll be a really fun conversation taking place at 4 p.m. Um, next Wednesday on our Instagram page. So until then, thank you again, Margaret. This was a really lovely conversation. Thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. Oh, of course. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.